recording on this computer, so I'm recording right now, and now I'm going to share my screen. Be back in just a second. Where'd she go? Okay. I watched that video of Ephesus. That was pretty interesting. Excellent. Did you, you enjoyed it? Yeah. Uh, I thought, you know, the incense part there <laughs> was strange. Oh, well, um, Marissa, while Kim is going to get her stuff and we've got a bit of time here before we jump in, uh, you said you had some questions. What were they? The incense actually got my attention as well because um, that place, the, like the mall that he was talking about, um, has a word for it, the Agora? Yeah, that, yeah. that's just the... Uh, Yep, but go on. So all these goods from all over the world go there, and that's where their social interactions and their status um, happens. And if they don't go there to get stuff, where did they go to get stuff? Because that was the challenge. They would have to burn some incense. And how did they navigate through that? And then also the temple was also the bank if I understand that. And so how did they get money if they didn't go to the temple? Um, well, you know, so how many of you drive around with a car with a little fishy on it or Ithcus? License plate. <laughs> might wear my cross, but not on the car. Okay, well, a lot of folks have those little markers and what they would do is they would approach these individuals on the side or they themselves would set up um, in their own quarters. That's why we have, you know, we talk about ghettos and, and uh, neighborhoods and different things like that, but they were places where particular nationalities or even um, religions would gather together and they would make really their own uh, business center, if you will. The best business was in the Agora or the marketplace. And in order to be part of that, you basically were when you would, how many of you eat Chinese or anything like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you go into the, you when you go into a Chinese restaurant, they're basically doing the same thing as, as dropping the incense into that little thing. When you walk in and you see the little bowl of fruit in, in front of Buddha, mm -hmm. they're doing the same thing. They're setting it up. These are offerings to you, and here's that initial offering uh, for them as you go in and dump the incense and let it burn, um, they're giving, uh, this This is like their act of worship there. So um, what would they do is they would go and they would um, set up side, side businesses, if you will. Um, and then they would set up that they would go after the marketplace and maybe go to their home, or they would meet them outside the marketplace just before they got in and they would pay for whatever they needed, or they themselves would open a market in their own little neighborhood with the little fish sign, the ichthys, or another uh, cross or something like that that would label it and so that those who are believers could go in and be able to purchase what they needed. But it just made life that much more difficult. Now, I had heard that if there was a greeting between two people, that one side of the uh, fish would be uh, put in the, in the uh, sand, and the other person would do the other side of the fish, knowing that they were both believers. I, I had never heard that, Jan, so uh, interesting. Uh, okay. we, can, we can- I was gonna say, did they tell you that when you went to Israel? Because you probably learned a lot. Yeah, but I think I had heard that somewhere else. Um, I was going to say that um, just recently, well, it was on the news, actually. There's a town in um, the United States right now that is making wood money. And it can only be spent in the town in which the money is being made. So I can see where they might have done this in Ephesus as you know their own trade kind of like a small business then well it's almost like bartering too well yeah I, and a lot of folks will do that there are some websites and some different um apps and stuff that you can get on uh 
online, different things like that, that you can barter your time or your goods uh, so that you don't have to pay cash. All right, so taking a look at this, what I want you to jot down if you're taking some notes is if you want to see how, um, if you're reading through the New Testament, you'll want to read Acts chapter um, 19. The whole chapter is where Paul actually goes into Ephesus and plants the church there in Ephesus. That's when it gets planted. And then Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse um, 17 all the way down to verse 38 um, is kind of the end of Paul gets uh, in in chapter 19 you see the raucous that's caused because of Paul and his ministry in three years um, he leaves at the end of three years and he goes and he plants a couple more churches and while he's finishing up in um, Asia just before he leaves to go back to Jerusalem he calls the elders of um, Ephesus down because he doesn't want to go back to the city and cause more trouble and more uproar. So they come down and they meet with him and he encourages, they pray together, and then he leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. So you'll want to read specifically Acts 20, uh, and I mean, Acts 19 and then Acts 20 um, to see how that it all works out. Um, to add to your understanding of what we're looking at in the church of Ephesus. You also may want to read the book of Ephesians because that's a letter that's addressed specifically to the church at Ephesus. And all of that is before we get to this particular letter that's written to them by Jesus in Revelation chapter two, verses one to seven. Now, um, Remember, I'm not sure if in watching all the videos that I tossed out to you, if you understood that Ephesus now is probably the most established church in Asia and was actually kind of the home church of all the um, Asia mission field, if you will, and churching plant, uh, church planting churches. And so, um, the church at Ephesus was actually there. It, it was there probably for about 30 years at the time that John now is writing um, this particular letter that Jesus makes him write to, to the church at Ephesus. So we're not looking at the first generation of believers. We're actually probably looking at possibly the third or the fourth generation of believers. And what happens to what happens to people who have been around for a long time and grown up um, and they've lost that, that uh, initial excitement and enthusiasm about being saved and being transformed by Jesus? Complacent. Okay, they grow complacent. What else? They can take things for granted. Okay, we take things for granted. Do we start focusing on um, what we did to get saved and what we needed to, you know, what we do in maintaining our relationship? Do we focus more on the, the um, ritual and the regulation than we actually do the relationship? Mm -hmm. I see and so that. We, we focus on teaching the rules and the um, regulations and the rituals and we take it for granted that those are promoting and developing the relationship with the people that come behind us. But they only see us doing stuff. They don't actually understand the relationship we have with Jesus. I was going to say going through the motions. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I've got on the screen here that I'm sharing with you, those are the videos, but I want you to jump down to the question at the bottom. With the understanding that this is probably the third or the fourth generation of believers that are there in Ephesus at the church, and they um, and you've heard two or three different individuals teach about the history, the culture, the background of Ephesus, um, do you see any similarities or any issues that would be familiar to us here in our country and in our setting right now in our lives with Ephesus? 
definitely what we are talking about with the whole um, buying stuff and and the social pressures. Okay, anything else? Um, well, we kind of have to change with the times. I mean, uh, for me, I'm not a big computer person, um, but yet the new generation right now is into the computer and so is communication through the computer. And so as an older person, I need to change with the times, even the music in the church. You're not that old. No, I'm not that old, but I'm just saying, I was never a computer person. Steve's the computer person. Okay. Kenny, and, you uh, say something? Yeah, one of the things is, uh, you know, the Romans required a census, and we have a census. Um, oh, uh, what else I want to say? Oh, they try to, uh, I don't know, enforce religion, whereas we're trying to get rid of it, I guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Kim, did you have any thoughts? <laughs> oh, I, I didn't uh, I didn't hear all of it, but okay. So what did she say? I said I'm listening. <laughs> She's listening. <laughs> trying to stay awake. <laughs> oh, well, well, I think you will now. So take a look. Um, so we've been looking at this and I gave you some handouts. Um, and this is what we'll be looking at as we go through each of the churches. But um, I, I put the verse up here, and um, we see the very first thing that Jesus does is he, he um, shares his title and a description of himself, and that's from um, Revelation chapter 1. And uh, he says, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven uh, golden lampstands, so my question for you is, why did you think, why do you think Jesus chose that title or description um, that he did for the church at Ephesus? Well, didn't you say that the seven stars is us, the church? The, the, um, the seven stars, yeah, I, I don't have my Bible open right in front of me. Way to go, Glenn. Um, <laughs> Seven stars of the seven churches. Right. The seven stars of the seven churches, the seven uh, lampstands represent the, the angels, right? Or are you speaking to right. the angels of the yeah. seven right. churches? Okay. Yeah. So um, why did Jesus choose to use that in particular as the title and um, way to start the letter to the church at Ephesus? There well, is a it I was going to say it being the first church and you said it is the home church that um, hey, it starts with them. <laughs> okay. Mine says it's indicating his power and authority over the churches and their leaders. Ah, okay. Uh, interesting. I, what I picked out that he used the, the lampstand part of it as his threat to the church. Okay. What do you think, and Chris? that he's the head. He's the head of it all. Nobody else is. He, he is. Okay. Marissa, did you have any thoughts there? Yeah, all sounds good. Ah! <laughs> okay. How many of you watched the uh, video with Joe Stoll? I did. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember when he was talking about having the um, the temple to uh, Domitian? Yeah. Okay. So it was interesting that he showed some clips there. Domitian was one of the Caesars. He's the one that persecuted the um, the Christians horrendously. In fact, he's the one that sent John to Patmos because he would not bow or worship him. And um, it was interesting that that temple was set up in Ephesus, and the way that it was set up is there were many, many columns, um, and there was this, this arch that you would walk underneath, and that arch actually at the very top of the arch um, was an example, was a... Uh, yeah, I remember that. A um, statue of himself, or pictures of him in particular at the very top. Literally, un underneath him were the other gods 
that had temples or that were worshipped in um, Rome, but also in Ephesus. So what Domitian was literally saying as the emperor of Rome is all the other gods are holding me up as the one true God that must be worshipped. So, it kind of remind. I was going to say it kind of reminds me of Daniel, where well, he was asked to bow down and he wasn't going to do that. Well, it was also interesting that at Ephesus, um, it was a harbor city, and because it was a harbor city, even though it isn't now, it's about six miles away from the shore. But the the boats would come in, and and there was a statue of Domitian that was over fifty feet tall. So that when you would come around into uh, from the coast and you were starting to come into the city, the first thing that you actually would see was this huge statue with Domitian's hand in the air, uh, almost like um, this is I mean, like the Black Lives Matter power hand up up that he is the the authority and the power that overrules this city as Rome, and that would be the very first thing that you would see. And then the temple that would worship the um, the Caesar in Ephesus was there. And he's at the very top of the column um, when you're walking under it to go in to worship him, if you will. And all the other gods are up. So I don't think that it's, it's um, coincidence. I believe that uh, Jesus is telling this church in particular that no matter what power and authority you are facing, I am the one that protects you and has the authority over you. Because that's the, that's the point. Notice that the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, those are the, the messengers, and he's holding them in his hand to protect them. Protect them from Domitian, even, that, even though they may lose their lives, um, he tells us that if we will um, obey and overcome, he will give us paradise, right? We'll be able to be with him in paradise. So there's his ultimate protection over what's going on. And he's the one that has the authority. Why? Because he's the one that walks among the seven golden lampstands. He has the authority to tell um, these messengers and the churches what's going to happen and how to behave and how to go forward. So this is a very appropriate um, title to be saying when they're in the Literally, if you will, they're at the foot gates of um, idolatry and pagan worship. They're at the footstool of it underneath Domitian. So he's going directly against what they're having to live in every single day. And so how does that apply to us? I mean, how does that apply to us in our lives today? We don't necessarily have a 50-foot statue of, of um, you know, our, our president or our Caesar, but how does this apply to our lives today when we're looking at this, that title, that he's the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, that he has all the authority and he has all the power. How are we to apply that in our lives right now in New Hampshire today? Witnessing um, can be fearful, especially with the reactions that we can get from people. Um, hey, my girls, for instance. Um, <laughs> or, you know, even the issue of the Black Lives Matter, or there's so many issues that people don't want to hear that God is supreme and he's the one in control and obedience is very important okay they don't want to hear i don't think they want to hear the truth that's it yeah okay they don't want to hear the truth they don't want to hear the truth and whether it's statistics about the numbers or it, it doesn't matter they don't want to hear it because they have their own agenda and you can't wave from their agenda. And if you do, they get mad because you're not agreeing. Okay. Any other thoughts? I was going to say at um, both Aspire and Haven, um, for 
early days, a girl can, can, would go in there and they could share the gospel with them. These days, they don't want even to hear it. Mm. Like, it's all right for me to be pregnant. Mm. I mean, the, the good thing about Aspire and Haven, they, um, they still give the gospel, but it's, it is, uh, you know, people are putting their hands up in, in the, you know, I don't want to hear that. And, um, but they always ask, can I share the gospel with you and, and go forward? Yeah. So, but you're absolutely right. There's more hands in the face than there were. Yes, please share with me. Um, okay. I, I get the similarity in what you were saying here. I want I want you to take it a little bit, um, take it farther there's okay we've got some similarity in that this is the opposition that we face because folks think that they have the power and the authority over us um but how does this how do we now apply the fact that god is the one who protects us and god is the one that has the authority over us i think you were in the right uh direction initially when you said um witnessing jan but how would we, you know, not everybody has the gift of evangelism, but we all need to be serving and, and loving and caring uh, and obeying Jesus. So how does this really apply to us as we're living our lives? I think you need to see that we're peaceful people Ooh. in the midst of uh, all of this. Okay, they need to see that we're peaceful people. Any other application? We should, we should so hold on to uh, a love of Jesus, I guess, and, and try as much as we can to um, be like him. Okay. And you can't, I was gonna say, you can't change a person. Only God can do the changing. Yep. And I think when it comes to witnessing, um, you, gotta, you gotta listen to hear where their heart is at and then be willing to, when the opening comes up, to be able, be willing to share without fear. Amen. Yeah, you, know, you, kind of, you need like a, a starting point to dive off that. Yeah, exactly. Take that bold step to, to witness. It has to be a relationship first. I would just, but, I would challenge that um, what it boils down to is the issue of obedience right? Yeah. Because yeah. in, in one sense, it could be witnessing. In another sense, it could be um, saying no to your boss for for something or um, going and, and obeying and caring for your neighbor when, when uh, you don't want to because they've offended you. Whatever it may be, the issue, no matter what, really boils down to one, God saying, I'm, I'm going to protect you no matter what, um, and I want you to obey me. I have the authority uh, to tell you what I want you to do, and this is where I want you to do it, and I'm going to protect you when you obey me. So I, I think um, as we're going through, all of those applications are, are fantastic, and it really boils down to actually obeying and trusting God that he's going to protect us when we obey him. So I was thinking of Columbine, that young lady who yeah. was willing to say, yes, I'm a believer, and she died. Amen. Oh, yeah. Cassie or Rachel, actually. Yeah. Take a look at um, number three here, our, our third uh, tile here, our th third slide as we're going through this. The passage we're looking at now is, is uh, Revelation 2, 2 to 3. It says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my namesake and have not grown weary. Um, this third one, as we're going through that kind of outline, how we're evaluating every one of the churches, it's, this is the words Jesus uses to encourage uh, the church at Ephesus, and he'll have different encouragements to the church at Smyrna and uh, Pythagoras and uh, yeah, all the way down the line. Sorry, I just said that one wrong, but However, he's got different words of encouragement. Here, I want you to notice one of the questions I have for you is, what are the six verb phrases used in these two verses? Verb phrases? Yep. Yeah, look at the 
look at the slide. I helped you out a little bit. <laughs> Old print? Is that what you're talking about? The ver well, notice I highlighted them for you. I made them in bold. Yeah. Yep, the bold print. You cannot tolerate. You put to the test. You found them to be false. You have perseverance and have endured. Have not grown weary. Okay, so here's six things that um, Jesus says directly about the church there in Ephesus that are praiseworthy. You, know, you that cannot tolerate literally means they um they spit them out of their mouths like they they are the minute the minute they hear something that is inappropriate they're gone they they just cut them right out um you put them to the test they're before they even allow somebody to kind of come in or whatever they're putting them to the test and evaluating every little thing to make sure that um, they are going to honor and glorify God as best that they can. Um, they said, you found them to be false. So here are three areas really about holding incredibly um, close to the doctrines and the truth of God's word. And there's no compromise whatsoever on it. And that's a good thing. And notice, well, go ahead. I was going to say, we were just, you know, we talked about um, the marketplace and also uh, the temple being the, um, where the, the bank is. And yeah, going through that, not doing the incense and not bowing down, they were willing to lay their life on the line. Mm -hmm. He says, you have perseverance. You've endured, and you've not grown weary. The, the reality is, is that even though the church in Ephesus was growing, and it was a strong church, they're constantly being overwhelmed and um, persecuted and attacked and, um, and just having to live underneath that kind of influence consistently every single day of their lives they weren't getting around it that it would be real easy for them to just give up and just go with the crowd right yeah exactly now and the, the reason i separated these two verses another encouragement that uh, jesus gave to the church there was yet this uh, you do have that you hate the deeds of the nicolaitans which i also hate and I'm going to see if I can, um, I'm just going to exit this for a minute. And I want you to, I don't know if you can see my notes. I'm going to go back. Uh, here it is. Is this coming up on your screens? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, I've got this article and I'll, I'll put it out on um, hope for you as well. I thought this was excellent. This really goes into a better understanding of the Nicolaitans and how it applied to the, the church there in Ephesus. And, and basically it talks about, I hate pop-up ads. <laughs> they do that all the time. That Nicholas um, and so if you went back into Acts chapter 6, verse 5, he was a convert um, in, in the church, but he got, he got lost in the philosophy of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism really taught that um, whatever you did in your body um, or happened to your body didn't really matter because it was more important about your soul and the knowledge that you had. Right. So literally, you could commit prostitution or idolatry or somebody else could come in and force you to do that but that was your body you what who you really were in your soul didn't do that it was just your body so that didn't count does that does that make sense so that allowed for a lot of compromise and in fact nicholas began to try and lead many away 
um, not just, uh, he was dead and gone by the time it got here, but there was a sect of believers that began to practice that way of, that uh, practice of faith or that practice of living, trying to tell everybody, well, it really doesn't matter what you do over here. It just, you know, it just matters what you believe but not actually, there isn't a change in your life of how you live. So they could go into the marketplace and put the incense in there to go in and, and do their business and everything because that didn't change their heart. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a, there's a difference between um, how they lived and how they actually believed. And, and God was saying, no, if you believe I am who you are, then you obey and you trust me, what we talked about in the very beginning. And it changes the way you live your life. You can't just go eat um, meat that was sacrificed to idols. You can't just go into the marketplace and do your little incense and think that's not going to have any impact on your life spiritually. All of this is growing calluses, and it's leading you away from faith in Christ than it is leading you to faith. It's, it's teaching you that it's okay to compromise on some very, very important things that it is not okay to compromise. And ultimately, they focused on the actual acts of worship. Um, and so as they, being in Ephesus, um, Artemis, or as we would know her, Diana, the goddess Diana, that whole place was so full of prostitution and, and uh, sexual orgies were part of the worship of Artemis and Diana, both of them the same, Artemis as Diana, that the Nicolaitans would even participate in that and that it had, you could still live and um, call yourself a Christian. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like the way so many folks live and believe today? Well, I would just... Go ahead thinking yeah um you rationalize sin um well, i'll just go to the casino and i won't play i'll just go though should we be doing that right no, so. or i'll go to that party but i won't drink okay so what do these passages tell us about this particular church Well, it's not everybody in that church, is it? No. Well, Jesus is writing to them because there's a, even if it's not everyone, um, we learn this through the Old Testament as well. There were many Jews in the Old Testament that still practiced and focused on the relationship with God, but it was such a, a few segment of the whole that God brought the judgment against the entire nation. Does that make sense? So there were so few that actually understood the relationship here that he was he was speaking to the whole church. So it's like it, even if you're good, you get brought down by the bad ones. Correct. But they, remember, uh, these are words are encouragement, Kenny. I was going to say, and and what they they were more. Uh, mindset of uh, church as a um, duty and not as a place that you want to go to or whatever. Ooh, wow. Good insight there. Well, they weren't going the there for love. Today. Yeah. Hey, hang on one second. Jan, what were you going to say? Kim, you're next. Um, I was going to say um, they didn't go to worship because they loved God. Again, they were going through the motions. Okay. Uh, good insight there, Kim. It's just like the C and E's. That's what I call them. You know, they come on Christmas and Easter, but they don't give a crap about the rest of the time. Ooh, wow. Okay. Any other thoughts, Marissa? I see your head bobbing. Um, amen. Oh. <laughs> I see her hair going with the wind. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking of some of our, um, the cults, um, even the Catholic Church, okay. where they really, they're here again, they're going through the motions. There's no heart change there. Okay, so why did the church at Ephesus do what they did? 
look at what Jesus is praising them for. Can't tolerate, put to test, found them faults, perseverance, endurance, um, not grown weary. Why did they, why did they do what they did? What they did they love? Wrote. What did this church love? Keeping up appearances. Okay, keeping up appearances. More specifically, what did they love? Themselves. Uh, truth. The rules. Okay. The, the truth and how they interpreted the truth was their rituals and regulations. The way you, you protected the truth was you do it just this way and you focus on this. And if you don't, then you're not right. And if you stray in any way from the truth, you can't possibly um, love Jesus the way you're supposed to. So you got to get out. Does that make sense? So is that externals versus internals? Uh, there's a lot there, yes. But what it really turns into is legalism. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, okay. It, so it I, legalism. I, I've been reading in Colossians in chapter 2, and, and Paul is talking to the um, church in Colossae. Uh, but also Laodicea is mentioned in there right before he talks about not legalism but Christ. So this was all at the same time. Okay. So how does this how does this encouragement to Ephesus encourage us though? Well, I think it's good to put to test whether it is truth or not truth. I'm just looking at your things that you uh you put up on that verse and you looked at. Yep. Oh no, um, I agree. And I think that perseverance is a big one. Ooh, okay. Yeah. I I go to uh um I believe it's Hebrews twelve that we haven't gotten to the point of shedding our own blood for obedience in Christ or for our faith. Mm. And a lot of us, you know, we we hear one person say, I, you know, we see the hand in the face. I don't want to hear that, and we shrink like violets and run away, hiding and scared because, well, I I can't share the gospel anymore, and that's not perseverance or endurance, is it? No. Okay. That's getting so, up. So the, the reality is, even even though we've kind of focused a little bit more because we, we've had a couple of weeks on this and we, we know um, as we move forward that Jesus has this against the church. The reality, though, is testing whether things are right and true according to God's word is, is something we need to do, um, not tolerating what is absolutely false and wrong. We shouldn't tolerate it at all. And um, we should be persevering and enduring, not just giving up so quickly or growing so weary. Um, and in, because there's some folks who just uh, get so frustrated and, and flustered with this world that they just um, become curmudgeons and stay in their houses. And they don't come out in fellowship and worship anymore because they're just so overwhelmed and tired and weary. And What's that's the word you used. Confludgent? Oh, curmudgeon. C U R M E O D G E O N, I think. Curmudgeon. Do I have to send that? I'll send that to you in the email. I'll, I'll play Balderdash with him. <laughs> yeah, I like Balderdash. We'll have to. Have okay, so here's Jesus' indictment, though, and I think we covered this fairly uh, good, but I'd like to dive into a little bit more. He says, but I have this against you that you have left your first love. What does that mean? Not what does this mean to you and I right here? What was Jesus saying to them after, after he praised them? What was he saying to them? Hmm. That they've lost their first place. Jesus um, being the first place in everything. Okay, I think that's an aspect of it, but what else? I can just see Jesus weeping. That um, I agree he, with you, but why? Because he he's lost the relationship with them. Okay, and so it, what were they focusing on? Remember what he praised them for. What was he? What was he? Um, 
what did they lose with him? Well, they had a lot of pride and they were oh. really, they were becoming God instead of God being God. Oh, wow. How were they becoming God? You, you're right on themselves. They were self-centered. Okay, what were you saying, Kim? They were benefiting themselves. Everything was for them and not for God. Well, it, it wasn't that it was for, for themselves. What they were doing is they had got, they had so focused on the rules and the regulations and the rituals that they left no room for somebody making a mistake. And when somebody would make a mistake, they came on, came down on them so hard that there was no grace, there was no love. Um, and, but the, the, they would have had to make mistakes because you're not perfect. Even those people who were coming down on the others were not perfect. And I'm sure they made mistakes, thought things they shouldn't think or did things they shouldn't do. Okay, so. Oh, well, but they covered up. How did they Probably. remember Jesus spoke about what, who did Jesus call um, serpents and vipers in the gospel? The Pharisees. Ah, there we go. The Pharisees. Fruit inspectors. They, they got, they would make excuses for themselves because they were the ones that were in yeah. power. Right. They oh, were gee, that sounds like today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, now, can this be said about you? If we're not careful. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got to be really, really careful. It, we're, we're not just be very, very careful in what we're saying here as well. We're not um, discounting truth. Okay. We're not discounting truth at all. But Jesus is full of what? Grace. Love and compassion and grace, yeah. Yep. First, uh, John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is full of grace and truth. truth. Yeah. Okay. In, in Ephesians, he actually tells us to speak the truth in with love. love. Never separate the truth. Never separate the two. Yeah. And, and so there are times when we have to be very, very careful because we may not understand what's going on in somebody's life and we just see that they did something wrong and we just come down on them like a ton of bricks without trying to figure out why they did what was wrong and Galatians and, six go ahead what is it Galatians six is what um having to do with the weaker brother and be careful you too can be drawn into sin yourself exactly so, so the reality of what we're, what he's doing here is he's saying you you miss that that love with me that just made you love everybody around you. Yeah, I thought you weren't supposed to hate. What's that? I said I thought you weren't supposed to hate. Okay. But if you're love and back of thing. It, you know, Jesus is our God was saying how he hates things. I thought we weren't supposed to hate. There's not a good translation of the word, but literally it's like he wants nothing to do with. In fact, um, we just did this with the youth group. In the Old Testament, he says, It is Jacob that I have loved and Esau yeah. that I hated. Hated, yeah. But he doesn't hate Esau. It's no. just that he chose Jacob. Right. We would use it this way. Um, I love Marissa, which would mean I hate every other woman. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. yeah. I don't hate every other woman, but I chose Marissa. And therefore, I have no room for any other woman because Marissa has all of my love. And that's that's the issue of what. But it's not hate the way we think hate is. Correct. Hey, Glenn. Yes, ma'am. Um, the word Ephesus. I in my uh, this book uh, Bible that I have, it says the meaning of it is desirable or darling. Well, it, yes. Do you know why? 
because it was his beloved church. He's the bride and we're the, uh, he's the bridegroom and the other way around. He's the bridegroom and we're the bride. <laughs> no, I, I get that part. But the, the reality of the word Ephesus, um, the church did not give it, give the city the name. Um, it was given by, well, it, it was already there, but it was desirable because three different roads came into Ephesus. So it became a huge metropolis and um, a city of wealth and commerce for Asia. It had a seaport. Um, so it was very valuable to Rome and to those that would be able to barter and, and trade coming in that way. It was um, the capital of the Roman outreach in Asia. So it was a Roman capital city. And so it was a darling, if you will, of Rome. It was a jewel in its ring of control around the world. Ephesus was its precious stone. That's why. Oh, so it has nothing to do with the name of the church. No. Okay. It's just the, the city of Ephesus, but a good call when you see it there. <laughs> So here's the next question that I ask here, because um, I need to know. I, I need to know um, about how you see the church. Can this, can, would Jesus say this about us? Have we as a Hope Community Chapel lost our first love? Hmm. I the think thought. all of us individually can lose our way. Mm -hmm. Okay, good call, Jan. I, I appreciate that. Would people who come in, would they see us um, only worrying about what we do, how we dress, what we look like, um, what standards we keep, or do they really uh, begin to connect with us um, that we want to love them and love them with the truth as well? I was going to say, Stephen and I came to this church because of coming as strangers to hear a special speaker. And we were invited downstairs to be a part of the potluck that we felt the love of the people that were in the church. Wow. Okay. And that was about two years before we ever came. Okay. Any other thoughts? It, it's okay, you're not gonna offend me. And, and guess what, those that wanna watch this video, this is a reality folks we don't we're made up as the church is made up of individuals but at the same time we as a, a corporate body are communicating something together as our corporate identity and if we're not careful we can be guilty that's why remember you asked a question initially jan um about the whole church what was he talking about everybody or or what and so yeah, we, we get this same rebuke, if you will, as a whole church body. If we don't um, love and, and really take this seriously. I think there might be um, pe people tend to stay together with people that are familiar with more than um, not everybody, but some. You know, and instead of, um, I say, spreading around, um, okay. let's say, sit with somebody new every week or something. <laughs> wow, that's a that's a good call. Mm -hmm. I, we're going to dive into this a little bit more in a moment, um, but let's take a look at Jesus' instructions to the church there in Ephesus, because he gave them a plan to fix it. He said, therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Now, this is specifically vague. <laughs> um, it's specific in that there's three things that he wants us to do. He wants us to remember. So stop and think about what was it like when you first came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? And how did that change everything about how you looked, how you felt towards people, how you lived your life, how you loved on people? Um, everything about that. Do you remember that? And do you remember how that really um, 
brought a smile, if you will, and really changed how people perceived you. Okay. Well, repent. The issue is, okay, where are you now? What are you doing right now? Turn around. Do the stuff. That's what he's saying. Repent and do the deeds you did at first. Return. Repenting literally means turn 180. So if you're walking in one direction, turn around. Stop walking that way and turn around and come back and do the stuff you did when you first got saved and loved Jesus with everything that you had. Okay, I don't know exactly what you did when you first came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but I bet some of it had to do with going to, to church and loving the people that you're with, asking lots of questions about how do you do this? How do you do that? What do I do? What, what happens here? Uh, praying and talking to God and, and praying with other people and just learning that stuff, having a hungry heart and having a desire to spend time with God, with his word and with his people. I mean, there's a combination of a whole bunch of things that are going on there. That's what God tells us to do. It's not hard. It's simple. It's just not easy, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Especially if you became a Christian at seven. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We I remember. Because, well, not too, too long off. I, it's uh, since I was nine. So we're, we're talking 42 years. Yep. <laughs> uh, you know, 42 years of remembering what it was like at nine. Well, there's something to be said to having the heart and the mind of a child to just love and desire to be with Jesus. And, and that takes work. It takes, per what did he say? You persevere, you endure. And what else? You hold on tight. You don't grow weary. Right. <laughs> And, and that's what especially he said. Especially at that age, you know, because I was young too. I think I was like, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade. And, you know, I veered off <laughs> sure. to now, you know, and, you know, the road, this road, that road to get here. This is a cycle. Veerance is that you have to, I think that I knew even though I was on the wrong road. And then I was like, okay, this is not it. And go to the right one. So I think he, he's always there. You know, it's just we're all different walks of life. You know, for Christianity, we're all learning at a different pace. And we all have our trials and tribulations we have to get through. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to say that I believe God brings stuff into our lives for a purpose and it is to, and because of those things, we have a testimony of perseverance, even in the midst of major trials. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, the gay issue with Sarah and, and Hannah, I mean, that's a big deal. And yet I have because I've gone through it, I can speak into or listen to other people who have gone through it too. And notice the <laughs> notice the uh, the cycle that's going on here. This isn't just a one, two, three um, step and it's done. No. This is a process. This is a cyclical right. process. We need to keep remembering. We need to keep repenting. We need to keep returning. Um, yeah. So when we when we realize that we're veering off, we've got to come back. So so when 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 I'm talking and encouraging folks, um, I know that uh, so many folks um, get stuck on. Well, I, I missed this day. I missed that day. I missed the other day. the The issue for me is: Are you regularly regularly getting into God's Word each week? There are some who can do it faithfully every single day. The problem for a lot of folks who do it regularly every single day is that they've just built it in. And so it's a, a secondary thought now, that, like tying your shoes or your heart beating. You don't even think about why 
you're sitting down to read and to pray. That's hey. exactly, yep, that, that's exactly like, um, like Ephesus, the people in the church. This is what you do, so go do that. Well, why am I doing this? What is this supposed to do for me? How is this supposed to build the relationship? Just go do it. <laughs> and that's the way they would kind of answer. So, so my desire is that you are sitting down regularly. So if you're only doing it once a week, you may want to add a couple because the more you do it, the more you're going to be blessed. But don't kill oh. yourself. Don't kill yourself if you can't do it every single day. Do it regularly. Um, and in so doing, keep remembering, keep repenting, keep returning to that first love of Jesus and spending that time and reminding yourself of why you continue to walk with him. Right? Now, number six, there's an ultimatum. And Kenny, you mentioned this in the very beginning. The ultimatum, he says to them, or else I am coming to you. So he's telling them, right? He gives them the cycle. Remember, repent, and return. Otherwise, I'm going to review everything that you did. And this review, I, I wanted to stay with the R's. So he's, <laughs> or else I'm coming to you. What happens when your boss calls you into his office or into her office and said, I, I want to go over a couple things with you. What are they doing? Yeah, it's yeah. a per review. personal review. Yeah. Hey, this is what's going on. Are you intimidated when your boss says that? <laughs> well, if Jesus is coming to you, notice what he's saying. I want to review what you're doing. This isn't what I wanted from you. So we have the opportunity. Jesus, again, here is being gracious and forgiving and merciful to us saying, hey, listen, if you'll remember, repent, and return, I don't have to come or else. I don't have to come and remove. I don't have to take your church. I, what's incredible here is that all that's left of the church in Ephesus, it was the mother church of all the churches in Asia. There's nothing left but ruins now in the city yeah. of Ephesus of that church and the people that worship there. There's nothing there anymore. He removed the lampstand because they didn't repent. And this is not just an act. This is a spirit. This is, this is a, um, something that we need to work into our lives to help us always be ready to repent. It's a humility that we need to seek after Jesus. And it's an, Jesus told the church in Ephesus, if you don't do it, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove you. And that's why so many churches, I believe it's the first church of the refrigerator. When we get like this, like the church in Ephesus, we don't grow hot and, and thriving and on fire because we're so loving. We grow colder and colder and colder till nobody yeah. wants to step foot yeah. in our doors and the door closes and nobody wants to be there. That's why I say it's the first church of the refrigerator. First church of the refrigerator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Steven's here. He was just chuckling at that. <laughs> so here's the proclamation that Jesus sends to all the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the what? Churches. Yeah. He says this to all seven of the churches. So what he's saying to the church in Ephesus, he's saying to Smyrna, to all the other ones. He's saying to us today at Hope Community Chapel. You know, that's what that means. If you've got ears on your head, are you really paying attention? Are you hearing? Not just with your head and not just hearing noise, but are you listening with your heart and your mind and your soul that you're ready to remember? repent and return. And it's the Holy Spirit who's saying this to us, right? The Holy Spirit is Almighty God. Are we ready to defy Almighty God and refuse to remember, repent, and return? Um, take a look at the last question in number seven here. How are we to apply it to us today as disciples of Jesus and as a body of Christ? How do we how do we apply this um, this phrase this thing to all the churches today? 
Mm. <clears throat> Wake up. <laughs> this is where I would say this is where we need to apply it to our church even more specifically. Hope Community Chapel, are we hearing? Are, are we so focused on our rules and our regulations, our order of service? Our, hi, Lynn. It's good to have you back. Um, are we so worried about the form that we really miss the function of why we are to be a church in Franklin, New Hampshire? The function is to lead people to Jesus Christ through love, through grace, not exempting truth, but through living that truth out in a wicked, hurting world. Are we a vision? Listening? Yeah, our, our vision. But but are we are we living out that Jesus is our first love? Mm -hmm. That's huge. But let me ask you a question right here. Have you ever been into BJ's or Sam's Club or any of the stores that they have a tester? They have somebody there in one of those little carts and say, hey, would you like to taste this? Oh, we used to love to do that on Saturdays. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So who are you more apt um, to take a test from? Somebody who's just sitting there and you can see them, they get a big scowl on their face and they're just flopping things along and they throw it into the oven or they throw it into the frying pan and they're not washing their hands and they're just, they're just there, hey, do you want one of these? Or from somebody that's got a real smile, engages you in conversation, says, hey, um, you know, would you like to try one of these? I've had these before and these are fantastic. Um, I have them with my potatoes or I have them with my steak and I just love them. I, I, I buy these regularly. Would you like to try one? Which one would you prefer? Second guy. Okay. Which church would you prefer? One who actually has the passion and the love and the grace of Almighty God living and empowering them in their lives, or one that just focuses on rules and rituals. Sit down here, stand up there, okay, go home. Really focusing on the love of Jesus in your life is going to transform the church body where we are. And Hope Community Chapel needs to grasp this. Jesus left his home in heaven and came to us here uh, on this world to show us exactly how to love one another and how to love the revelation of almighty God to the world. All right, we're going to finish up right here. Jesus promised to individual disciples into the body of, of uh, Christ. So to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I thought Joel stole, Joe Stoll did a really good job of explaining this. Um, when the, knowing that the church was being persecuted and even as individuals, like if they did not worship God, they couldn't sell in the marketplace. If they didn't worship um, Domitian, they would be persecuted and um, possibly even killed. What was interesting is what he shared there in that story is that there was a huge tree that grew as part of the practice of worship right in front of the temple of Artemis or Diana. And pregnant women would come and they would touch the tree and they would pray at the tree asking for the god Diana to make sure that their baby grew and that they would be able to have a family and that they would be blessed with, with whatever. Um, other people would come and pray at that tree and touch the tree and pray um, at that tree for their crops to grow and to be fertile and to, to be blessed. <coughs> Domitian and the conquerors, they would have private gardens that, that they would invite those who were dignitaries and those that were close to them into that garden and they would have celebrations there. Basically what Jesus was promising this church was that if you will stay faithful to me and love the way that I have loved you and demonstrate that to the world around you, I will invite you into my private paradiso, my private paradise garden to live with me forever. So in the face of insurmountable persecution, 
in trials and tribulations in Ephesus, Jesus, en Jesus enters in and challenges the church there at Ephesus, return to me and love me with all of your heart so that I can love through you to this world that so desperately needs it. For those that are pushed aside, those who aren't paid attention to, if you will obey me and love the way that I've asked you to love, I will invite you to spend eternity with me. I will guarantee your eternity with me in my private paradise, heaven. How does that message communicate to this world today? Well, we're in a time right now where <laughs> I think people are more open to hear okay. because of the fear that is out there. Do you know of folks that um, feel like they've been pushed aside? Do you know of folks who have been hurt and beat up by not just the world, but maybe some folks who say, you don't fit in with us, so we don't want anything to do with you? Do you know of folks who feel lonely and oppressed? Do you think that this message with love communicates to hearts that are so desperately seeking one that they can worship? One that would meet their need? This is what Jesus is promising. I, I am the one who holds the seven stars in my right hand. I'm the one that holds the lamp, walks in the center of the lampstand. I am granted to eat the tree of life in my private paradise for eternity. Come to me, all you who labor, who are weary and need rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, right? I am gentle and humble. I will teach you. Isn't that a message that needs to be getting out there? And the only way that we can communicate it is if we love Jesus with all of our hearts and our souls. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. The second is like unto it, your neighbor as yourself. Remember, repent, return. Even if you are loving Jesus, with all of your heart and your mind, your soul, your strength, and you're trying to love your neighbor, go back and remember how Jesus communicated in the scriptures. Remember how Jesus just, just lit your day up and begin to ask him to show you how you can love each other and him better. And then begin practicing that. I think that's the message of Ephesians um, in the church at Ephesus here. It reminds us on a daily basis how we can love him more and love our neighbors better. Never, never making compromise for the truth, but always allowing that love to overwhelm the truth. Hey folks, we've been on here for an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> this one was a long one, but it was a good one. I'm going to end us today and um, we'll come back next week. Okay. Take a look at that next week. week. Well, oh, we'll right. take, we'll take a look at it in two weeks. Okay. All okay. right. All right. God bless you. And what a great study today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're Bye. welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.